Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to invite you to the first ESID Grand Round of 2022. Happy New Year to you all. Um, I can see that there are over 100 participants joined. I guess there may be some people uh, still to join, but I think we should make a start so that we don't run too far over time. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Siobhan Burns. Um, I'm a professor for translational immunology at University College London, um, and I'm going to be chairing this session uh, along with uh, Klaus Varnatz from uh, Freiburg. Klaus, do you want to just turn your camera on and say hello? Hello. Thanks, Klaus. Um, and uh, we've got a great panel this afternoon. We've got a number of speakers and um, a number of panel members, um, and th they will... Uh, actually, if, just as I introduce each one, if each of you could just briefly put your camera on. So first is, is Dr. Annick van de Ven uh, from, uh, from Groningen. Uh, welcome, Annick. Uh, Paul Maglioni from Boston University School of Medicine. Thanks, Paul, for joining us. Uh, Joris van Monfrans from Utrecht. Hi, Joris. Um, Bora Fevang from Oslo. Ayora, um, and John Hurst from University College London. Hello. Um, Heather Levis from Utrecht. And Klaus, I already introduced. So we're going to start off with um, presentations as we've uh, done before, and we will have time for a panel discussion at the end. And um, in terms of what we'd really like you to come away with at the end of this webinar, we'd like you to know how to diagnose GLILD with confidence. We'd like you to know how to manage GLILD in the short, medium and long term. And we'd like you to know who to ask for GLILD help if you need it. So there are three learning objectives from today. And if you have questions uh, as we uh, go along, please put them in the chat, in the Q&A. Um, and we will be monitoring the Q&A um, and we'll pick that up at the end. Uh, so I'm going to not take up any more time and we're going to go to directly to Annick and then the speakers will just follow each other uh, one after the other, as as in the uh, slide deck. Thanks very much for that, speakers. So, Annick, off you go. Thank you, Shilban, for the introductions. Can I have the first slide, please? Um, because we would like to start with a by presenting a case, and the case is a 32-year-old male, and he was diagnosed with CVID according to the diagnostic cr criteria described uh, three years ago in Jackie in practice. So regarding clinical criteria, uh, he noticeably did not have any um, uh, infections, so no increased susceptibility to infections, but he had uh, autoimmune manifestations, namely idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, for which he was treated with high dose prednisone and IVIG, uh, to which he responded well. Uh, and he also had splenomegaly. Um, he had a marked uh, decrease of IgG and uh, uh, IgA, but his uh, IgM levels were normal. Uh, the specific antibody um, uh, response was in impaired. And uh, regarding immunophenotyping, he had the typical CVID uh, phenotype with um, decreased uh, memory B cells, both uh, class switched and uh, not uh, switched uh, memory B cells. Uh, and secondary causes of hypogamic globulinemia were excluded, such as proteinuria and protein losing enteropathy. Can I get the next slide, please? Next. Hi, Paul. Um, can I just use this? Um, if you just saw and heard these last um, data when presented by Anik, um, I think we would just like to hear your thoughts on whether there are already some marks um, which you find um, important in the context of pathogenesis of what we call interstitial lung disease and CVID. Yes, uh, thanks, Klaus. And and, uh, and I thank you to the panel for the chance to speak with this um, group on this important topic. Um, I think there are some very key uh, points to the case, and I'll, I'll go into more detail in just a moment. But I think hearing about the autoimmune history, um, oftentimes these patients will present not only just with interstitial lung disease, but also with other um, uh, um, immune dysregulation components. And um, so for my portion, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So for my portion of the talk, I'll try to talk um, a bit about uh, the pathogenesis and give an overview of interstitial lung disease in CVID. And as was mentioned in the introduction, the term that's frequently used is GLILD or, or uh, granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease. Um, now, the, um, the understanding of how common this is to occur in CVID, um, generally, I think our best guess, and we, we don't know with certainty, and it also depends, and I think we'll talk about this in terms of how we define it, how frequently it does occur in CVID, but it's typically diagnosed in about 10 to 20% of CVID patients, I think our best estimate. Um, and classically on CAT scans, you'll see pulmonary nodules. And this can even occur in asymptomatic patients, which is an important piece that we'll, I think, discuss. Um, the nodules are typically larger than a sarcoidosis patient and, and more diffuse, of course, but of course, these rules aren't always hard and fast in every case. Now, the pathology that gives it this, this term, GLILD, uh, is one that is quite, can be quite heterogeneous. So it'll have granulomatous components, which is where the G comes from, um, and it's why this term, uh, GLILD, is, is, is a broad encompassing term, because there's going to be presence of granulomatous inflammation, but together with lymphocytic inflammation. And the types of pathology that are often defined um, include uh, follicular bronchiolitis. Now, this is when there is uh, lymphoid hyperplasia typically bordering or in the proximity of the airways. Um, and then along the same spectrum of that is lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. And this is where the inflammation now, um, the lymphocytic inflammation is now more broadly involved in the lung interstitium. So we think this could be a, this could be a continuum from the, from the follicular bronchiolitis. In, in some patients, they'll have more of a nodular lymphoid hyperplasia, and this may be defined by more uh, or um, well-demarcated lymphoid follicles. So you'll really see these follicles, which I'll show you some uh, examples of, which can be a feature in, in some patients quite profoundly. Um, and importantly, there is uh, often found a non-necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. And so this is, again, where we get this uh, GLILD uh, term uh, because of the presence of this granulomatous inflammation. Organizing pneumonia is also uh, can be found and is another uh, piece to this uh, 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 heterogeneous uh, GLILD presentation. Next slide, please. So here's an, um, the actual um, example from, from biopsies. And so I'll start with on the left um, of the slide in, in panel A, you'll see an example of, of this uh, follicular bronchiolitis that can be seen. And so you see um, a lymphoid follicle Colorful that we have circled where we have this lymphocytic inflammation in the proximity of, a, of an airway. Um, and so the inflammation is largely limited to that area, which is where, um, at least in this you know, photo, we would call that more of a follicular bronchiolitis in contrast to what's shown in B, where you have far more um, apparent involvement of the interstitium with the same appearing lymphocytic inflammation. And you'll see, again, encircled is that um, is that um, uh, lymphocytic inflammation around an airway, but then now you see the expansion into more uh, generally into the interstitium. In, in panel C, you see again um, that uh, follicle. And here, I think you really can begin to appreciate the terminology of GLILD, where you can see a, a, a you can actually see a granuloma or um, indicated by the black arrow. Uh, so you can have this, again, the spectrum on the same uh, pathology of granulomatous inflammation, as well as uh, lymphoid hyperplasia and the classic GLILD type of um, features. Uh, and then D, you can see very, very profound lymphoid follicles characteristic of nodular lymphoid hyperplasia, which can occur as well in the lungs of these patients um, and can, again, fall within this um, GLILD type of presentation potentially. Uh, and this, these follicles, uh, these cell follicles uh, are, or lymphoid follicles really got us quite interested as uh, it's quite a, a fascinating, I think, finding in patients that have a, um, a, a defect of B cell maturation and function to see this and to see the sort of formation of these follicles. And when you stain with classical B cell markers like CD20, you can find them in the lungs quite uh, well circumscribed and interacting with uh, CD3 positive uh, T cells, much as you would see in, in lymphoid tissue. So you can have in some of these biopsies, a tertiary lymphoid-like structure appearing in the lungs um, with markers like CD23, which can mark um, these uh, follicular dendritic cells, which are classic of lymphoid tissues, as well as BCL6, which could be a marker of, of um, germinal center or attempts to form germinal centers. And then KI67, which is a marker of dividing cells. And so you can see a lot 
that these become active centers. Now we know CBID patients um, have failure to, to undergo maturation in the typical processes that would give us good antibody responses, long-lived memory and plasma cell responses. Uh, but you can see the attempts to make these responses, uh, at least in some of the patients, and that could be contributing to the pathology. Uh, next slide, please. So here are some of the characteristics that we'll see, um, as I mentioned, uh, as illustrated in the, in the first slide, um, a lot of the features of that um, example patient that we're discussing are really quite characteristic of patients that will have ILD. Um, you'll see profound loss of, a loss of, um, of IgG, as well as IgA and often IgM as well. Um, you'll see deficiencies of isotype switched memory B cells, as well as deficiencies in, in T cells or dysfunction of T cells, which is probably an important component. Um, there could be deficiency or impairment of, of T regs in particular, which could be important for regulating immune dysregulation and what's predisposing to this complication. Um, there, there may be, uh, at least in a subset of patients, and I'll describe that, a, a, an increase in serum IgM as the disease progresses. So these patients might initially have low IgM and you might see it increase a bit as reflective of these active centers of, of um, B cell um, expansion that where I was just showing you in some of that occur in some of the patients. You may also see an increase in the transitional B cell uh, stage in circulation or even potentially in tissues that you normally would not see at, 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 at high levels um, in these uh, areas. Um, as, and as, as illustrated in the case that's being discussed, you often will see um, immune dysregulation beyond the lung. So this can be demonstrated by a history of autoimmunity, and this is often autoimmune cytopenias like ITP, uh, lymph, adenop lymph adenopathy, or enlargement of the spleen as well. Next slide. And it's also important to recognize the, that the CVID-like disorders may also um, present with interstitial lung disease. Now, this is a paper now going on six years old, but I think it's still useful. It is um, to sort of illustrate this particular point uh, in that these were uh, subjects from a single center, Mount Sinai in, um, in, in New York, uh, which were of the complicated phenotype of CVID. So meaning not just infections, but also autoimmune or lymphoproliferative complications and looking for genetic etiologies. And what were found was a number of them illustrated here uh, that we have now gone on to uh, many groups uh, and those in attendance on this panel or at, at this session um, have done you know, fantastic work to help define and understand these complications. And also, um, it, uh, if you can um, just uh, also just uh, click ahead on the slide, here, I think there should be an animation, that there are precision therapies. And now I'm not gonna talk about therapy in this uh, initial part, but I wanna illustrate it because it highlights the pathogenesis and how some of these genetic defects uh, of these CVID-like disorders, such as staph gain of function or loss of CTLA-4 or, uh, or the uh, related molecule LRBA can lead to an immune dysregulation phenotype that could predispose to a GLILD type in um, lung disease uh, but also open up potential for precision therapies. And this is something that I think we'll discuss in, in this session is there's a balance when you're, uh, many of the therapies that are used uh, for GLILD um, can be um, immunosuppressive. And when you um, are considering immunosuppression in the immune compromise, that's not an easy decision always. So trying to find the therapies that most narrowly target the immune dysregulation uh, might be the, um, the most effective approach. And I think that's really been opened up by genetics and it also illustrates, in terms of the pathogenesis, how um, some of the pathways may be driving the interstitial lung disease. For example, loss of um, T cell uh, regulatory functions such as uh, CTLA-4 could be very key uh, in terms of the pathogenesis of ILD as illustrated by patients who've had defects in this protein. And so I think this is um, really opening our eyes in terms of under beginning to understand very complicated interstitial lung disease. Uh, next slide. Um, and I wanted to highlight also um, talking about what we're trying to understand in the uh, genetically undefined patients. So in this study, we really try to focus on CBID patients that, that were genetically undefined. We did include some patients with defects in the protein TASI because largely we're considering those uh, to be disease, uh, disease to, to be a disease uh, modifying variant. But here, I think trying to uh, make sense of some of the um, lung disease uh, heterogeneity, we, we, we um, looked at these patients uh, um, and that had um, a lung disease that had really profound um, B-cell hyperplasia. So 
really well circumscribed uh, these cell follicles in the lung. And these patients, w- when we were looking back retrospectively, we could see that they were found. Um, this is when we looked at the, um, the electronic medical record. We found those patients who had an increase in their serum IgM um, tended to be those who had uh, pulmonary function decline over the next year or two. Uh, this is FBC, so this is the forced vital capacity. And when we looked at this, we saw those who had an increase in serum IgM of 10 or more tended to be those who had a progression. And some that were had a more stable IgM level tended to be you know, more stable in their, in their interstitial lung disease. And this uh, may speak to some of the active inflammation or the active uh, centers that these B cells are in the lungs. And so as, as an example, we see one biopsy where we stained IgM in green. And, and um, IgD is in, um, is in red, which uh, helps to demarcate the follicles. You can see the IgM is spilling uh, out of these follicles, these IgM positive or producing uh, B cells, which may reflect uh, what we're seeing in the serum. Those who have a, a lot of activity, a lot of IgM production tend to be those with, with a lot of progression of their ILD. And then in contrast, those who have fairly quiet lungs, not a lot of uh, activity there, um, reflective of their serum being stable, their lung disease tended to be stable. So this might be a clue at least subset of patients, particularly those with very profound uh, B-cell hyperplasia. Um, okay, uh, next slide. Okay, and then here, um, as I mentioned, I'm not gonna talk about treatment, but I wanted to mention this just in terms of pathogenesis, highlighting the importance of B-cells. We looked at patients who had received B-cell depleted therapy retrospectively, it's not a prospective or a, you know, placebo controlled trial, but looking at that, and we could see that there was a response in those who had monotherapy with rituximab. And I, and, and I know our, our group and others had had anecdotal experience giving rituximab in patients, perhaps you know, giving it for something like ITP and then seeing an improvement in the lungs. So we um, you know, looked at that and were able to see uh, that even with monotherapy, we could see some improvement, although in many patients, it was only transient. Ultimately, they did re- require a combination therapy um, to maintain a longer um, disease remission. But I think it illustrates the importance of those follicles and those B-cell centers as perhaps um, uh, active drivers of some of the inflammation or at least organizing some of that inflammation. Um, okay, you can uh, go ahead to the next slide. And so lastly, I just wanted to highlight some of the, uh, the, the current literature which has you know, identified uh, uh, interferon gamma and, and you know, related uh, cytokines as perhaps being a, a feature or a, evidence suggesting that it is a feature of more complicated CBID disease course. And how does that play a role with B-cell hyperplasia? And of course, there's a whole uh, field uh, evolving around you know, STAT1 expression in B-cells and what those B-cells are doing. Um, but also it could have a role in terms of driving uh, B-cell activating factor or BAF, which is a cytokine for which Tassi is a receptor for. And we know that um, CBID patients could have uh, variants in Tassi and Tassi could uh, it plays a role in terms of, of autoimmune disease and lymphoid hyperplasia, so it could be playing a role in some of this B-cell dysregulation I spoke about, um, that this may be one of the ways why those TASI variants are disease modifiers. It's, it may predispose to a little more sensitivity to um, alterations in the cytokine, which may be driven by um, an underlying cytokine dysregulation shared amongst uh, CVID patients with the more complicated phenotype. I think I'll, and I think I'll end there. Great, thanks. So Anik, will you take over again presenting the case? Yeah, if we move back to the case, so after diagnosis, uh, the patients were started on uh, IVIG uh, replacement uh, therapy, which he tolerated well, and uh, he went through life uh, mostly uneventfully. Um, uh, We did uh, do a PID panel on the um, uh, known uh, genetic causes, so including the, the... mutations uh, Paul mentioned, like CTLA-4 and uh, LRBA and uh, PI3 kinase delta, uh, but he didn't have any um, uh, mutation. Uh, he also didn't have any pulmonary complaints, no shortness of breath, no coughing, but um, a chest x-ray, x-ray revealed uh, on both sides infiltrative changes. So, um, uh, f- a further diagnostic evaluation was performed, including a uh, HR uh, CT scan and uh, pulmonary function test. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
So here you can see a summary of his uh, pulmonary function test. If you look at, um, at uh, lung volumes of the spirometry, his forced vital capacity and his forced expiratory volume um, in one second were still uh, within normal range. Uh, bear in mind, though, that we don't have previous me uh, measurements of this patient, so it could be low for him, uh, but it can, can also be still normal. Um, and he did, he did have a slight uh, decrease in his uh, diffusion capacity. Uh, next slide, please. And then, yeah, here you can see uh, some um, uh, key images of his uh, high resolution uh, CT scan. And um, yeah, this scan showed uh, actually a multiple uh, intrapulmonary nodules. Um, uh, mostly in the lower fields, but actually throughout uh, uh, all throughout both lungs, and also consolidations with with uh, as you can see in the upper left uh, with ground class um, opacity around it, um, all distributed mostly around the uh, bronchi and the uh, vascular structures, um, and uh, there was no clear lymph adenopathy, although his mediastinal uh, lymph nodes were quite pronounced, but not clearly enla enlarged. And the radiologist mostly thought of a fungal infection, particularly Aspergillus, when he saw the, these uh, pictures. So I think now we move on to more information about the diagnosis. Great. That's right. Thanks, Anik, again. And Bure, would you like to um, update us on the current status of um, diagnostics for ILD? Um, yes, thank you. Um, 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 next slide, please. I think it's the first one. Yes, so um, uh, um, thank you for this opportunity to, to uh, talk about a difficult and, and um, exciting topic, the diagnosis of, of interstitial lung disease. And um, I think we start with the, the possibly most difficult issue of ILD diagnostics. So, uh, Margrethe, if you could uh, show the poll, please. Um, so, um, having a patient with suspected ILD in need of treatment, would you take a pulmonary biopsy? So, if you please uh, give your answer. It should uh, show up on your um, Zoom uh, screen. And here we have the results of the ESCD um, jury. So, there's 16% um, who would always take a biopsy, 30% uh, would often take a biopsy, 47% um, saying only in specific cases and 7% and saying almost never. So that I think that's, um, um, uh, it's a good description of, of uh, um, what you hear when, when talking with colleagues about biopsies. Uh, we have diverse uh, uh, views on this and, and um, perhaps we, uh, through our discussion today, might be able to, to um, uh, get to a more agreement. So next slide, please. So the um, diagnostic procedures of ILD and CVID is of course based on the definition and diagnostic criteria of uh, ILD slash GLILD. Um, uh, GLILD is described as a distinct clinical radiopathological interstitial lung disease. And so the patients are characterized by clinical, radiological, and histopath histopathological findings. Clinical features are dyspnea and chronic cough, reduced pulmonary function tests like forced vital capacity, FBC, and diffusing capacity of, diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide, DLCO, and importantly, the exclusion of uh, um, in, under any underlying infections. There are then several radiological and histopathological findings that I will comment upon shortly, but the main point is that uh, of this slide is to show that Patients may present all or some of these uh, manifestations. Next slide, please. The main symptoms of ILD is exertional dyspnea and chronic cough, often accompanied by reduced pulmonary function tests like FVC and DLCO. Um, uh, forced expiratory volume in one second, FEV1, is a less reliable marker as it will be influenced by airway disease like infections. Uh, CVRD patients with ILD have markedly reduced FVC and DLCO compared to CVID patients without ILD, but most importantly, uh, 
many patients will have a steady decline in pulmonary function, as uh, shown in this uh, uh, figure from a publication by Paul Magoni in 2015. The, the red dots here represent patients with progressive disease uh, as based on predefined criteria, while the blue patients are have a more stable disease. And there seems to be an earlier and more steady decrease in DLCO as compared to FVC that drops more rapidly after some observations. Patients will initially typically complain about exertional dyspnea, but DLCO and FVC are measured at rest and will often show normal levels. Um, there is a clear case for testing patients during exercise, and many centers will use the six-minute walking test. In our experience, the six-minute walking test will not be sensitive enough to detect exertional dyspnea in the majority of patients. It will be better to take them for a walk in the stairs or do a full cardiopulmonary exercise test, as shown here in this paper from Marcellis et al. Um, this is a study on sarcoidosis patients correlating DLCO at rest with results from the exercise test, and it shows two important things. First, there is a clear correlation between values of, of DLCO and exertional um, capacity. But secondly, there is a group of patients with preserved DLCO at rest at the upper right corner that perform quite poorly of the, on the exercise test. Um, and speaking from my own center, this is clearly something we should get better at. Next slide. Radiological examination with high resolution CT scans is the most important diagnostic measure in ILD. And the main radiologic findings in ILD is ground glass opacities, reticulation and septal thickening, and the presence of nodules. Findings typically have a peribronchial and perilymphatic distribution pattern and will often wax and wane over many years with a steady increase in overall pathology. Several different scoring systems of ILD and CVID have been developed, and, and two of them, the Bauman scoring system and the Hartman scoring system, were compared head to head in this still pad study by Jennifer Merberg and, and co workers. Both methods showed a high degree of inter observer and intra observer reproducibility, but the Hartman method performed slightly better and took twice the time 30 minutes versus 15 minutes. Uh, for the Bauman method. Um, the Bauman method assessed the lungs as a whole and the Hartman method assessed the different lobes separately. In Oslo, we have for research purposes, scored each segment increasing the time needed for scoring to 45 minutes. Interestingly, our radiologists also made a first impression overall assessment of pathology and it was quite precise, even when compared to the more meticulous segment scoring system. Next slide. Um, we published a study this winter using our Oslo scoring system on radiologically defined ILD patients. And even if it is difficult to compare the specific radiologic findings to each other, we see in panel A that traction bronchiectasis and interlobular septal thickening are prominent findings. Panel B shows how the overall pathological score is distributed in the different segments. And a major finding is that the upper segments in all lobes are relative, relatively spared. Next slide. Going back to Jennifer Merberg's paper again, here is a Venn diagram showing the distribution and overlap of major radiologic features. In the same way that our radiologists in Oslo quite rapidly get the overall impression of uh, ILD in, in, in CVID based on multiple features, these diagrams show that a majority of patients present a fine blend of all pathologic ILD features, giving a typical GLILD appearance. Next slide. Um, we are great fans of PET CT in Oslo and, and really appreciate the many ways this imaging can help us in particular inflammatory disease. Um, the PET CT images are really intriguing to watch and intuitive to interpret as shown to the right here uh, with scannings from a patient before and after treatment with rituximab. It may be difficult to see here, but the pulmonary lesions with FDG uptake simply disappeared, in addition to substantial decrease in FDG uptake in thoracic and intra-abdominal lymph nodes. We also tried to do a more systemic, systematic evaluation of, um, of the PET-CT findings, looking at the standardized uptake values, uh, the SUV mean for the whole lung volume, as well as the maximum SUV, and also the metabolic lung volume. Both the, both the SUV mean and the ML we showed clear differences between patients defined as having a stabilized versus progressive disease, pointing to an active inflammation in the latter group. It's fascinating to look at, but how to use it? 
um, perhaps in patients with severe radiological features where you are unsure whether these represent active inflammation or post-inflammatory changes, including patients with previously treated ILD where you are concerned about a relapse. Next slide. Uh, the recurrent respiratory tract infection seen in hypogamma globulinemia, like CVID, is a major challenge to the correct diagnosis of ILD and the exclusion of infection an important issue, especially prior to starting treatment. Microbial analysis of bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, BALF, has therefore become an essential tool in the diagnostic workup of CVID patients with suspected ILD. As shown here in the consensus doc st statement from the British Lung Foundation, culture, cultures of ordinary bacteria, mycobacteria, and fungi should be performed in all patients, while the need for PCR for respiratory viruses and pneumocystis uroveci is more debated. We have had some surprises here, but I think our most frequent find, finding um, is, um, is Haemophilus influenza. Next slide. Bronchoalveolar lavage is not only useful for excluding infections, it can also give us a glimpse of the immunolog immunological processes driving ILD that might be of importance, not only to research, but also diagnosis and selection of treatment. The pulmonologists have a long tradition for phenotyping T cells in bowel in sarcoidosis patients, typically finding high CD4, uh, CD8 ratios. In CVD, however, the relatively low CD4, CD8 ratio seen in peripheral blood is reflected also in bronchoalveolar lavage fluid as shown to the left in this figure in a recent publication from Klaus Warnert's group. They studied bowel fluid for more than 60 CVD patients and compared it to sarcoidosis. And a main finding in this paper is a skewing towards Th1 cells in CVD, while Th17 cells were more dominating in the sarcoidosis group. As they have previously reported, the inflammation associated CD21 low B cells were most common among the B cell population, again, in contrast to sarcoidosis. I will not go into the pathogenesis of ILD, but it seems clear that these findings could be of prognostic importance in the individual patient. As I understand, some centers do this cellular immunophenotyping of, of bowel as a part of routine diagnostics in, ELD, in ILD and CVD. But I guess for, for many of us, it's still part of a more experimental toolbox. Next slide. Well, while we have a low threshold for doing bronchoscopies here in Oslo, we have a high and perhaps too high threshold for taking biopsies of pulmonary parenchyma. Reading the literature, biopsies are recommended and sometimes strongly recommended in the diagnosis of ILD in, in CVD. The main argument being that uh, HRCT findings are not specific enough to warrant a diagnosis of ILD in general, and that you might miss important information um, on the presence of granulomas and fibrosis if you leave this procedure out. The risk of overlooking lymphoma, even if they are rare, is of course also a concern. But there is a risk of the procedure as well, and there is also a risk of delaying diagnosis and treatment as one ponders the pros and cons of taking the biopsy. While many studies only include patients with a biopsy-proven GLILD, some relies on radiology only. In this study from Amar Manina and co-workers in Denver, they retrospectively reviewed 34 patients with GLILD, 19 of them diagnosed with a surgical biopsy and 15 without. The clinical course was similar. So should we walk the talk? What can we gain from taking the biopsies? What do we find? Next slide. This review, first authored by Fatima Dalla and Dylan McLaughlin, summarized histopatho histopathological findings in five original articles. And a central and bit disappointing conclusion is this. There is a great variation in histopathological features observed from 5% granulomas in the study by Smita Patel to 93% in a study from Jack Root's group and the presence of fibrosis varying from 3% to 75%. There's a clear need for standardization of histological assessment and development, at least if the histopathological findings shall be able to help us choose the right therapy and not only to rule out lymphoma. Next slide. So can we diagnose without biopsy? Are there other clinical and immunological features that can provide the GLILD diagnosis with a high degree of certainty? In this analysis from a large uh, Italian study from Francesco Cinetto, Riccardo Scarpa and co-workers, they compared 20, 
three biopsy proven GLILD patients to 66 CVID patients with no radiologic features of ILD. They found that the combination of splenomegaly, history of autoimmune cytopenia, low DLCO, and high percentage of CD21 low B cells analyzed together in a multiple regression model predicted GLILD to a high degree, as shown here in this ROC curve. Next slide. So what to choose when diagnosing ILD or GLILD in CVID? Uh, we have together with colleagues in Copenhagen, Denmark, Gothenburg and Stockholm, Helsinki and Olo made this diagnostic checklist for GLILD to be used in a prospective study. But it might perhaps also be useful as a reminder in everyday clinical care. Some strongly recommended procedures are in bold. HRCT, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage for microbial analysis, pulmonary function tests and genetic testing while others are more optional. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Anik. <clears throat> yes, um, so after this um, great overview of the diagnostic um, evaluation, we move back to the case. And uh, indeed, we also did a diagnostic evaluation um, uh, trying to exclude infection and malignancy. Uh, blood results uh, did not show any uh, signs for, for pathogens. Uh, a bronchoscopy was performed, including a bronchoalveolar lavage and transbronchial biopsies were taken. Um, the bowel fluid um, was cultured for uh, bacteria, viruses, actinomyces, fungi, and also for mycobacteria, but everything remained negative. And uh, immunophenotyping was performed, uh, partly a uh, research setting, um, which showed increased uh, numbers of lymphocytes and um, uh, increased numbers of B lymphocytes. Also, the CD21 low B lymphocytes were increased. Um, the patient also had uh, high numbers of D cells in his blood, by the way. Uh, Transporonchial biopsy uh, of the right uh, low. Uh, lower lobe uh, revealed an aspecific alveoli alveolitis. Uh, there was an increased number of uh, mostly intraalveolar macrophages. There were no pathogens found and um, uh, no malignant cells uh, visible. Next slide, please. So um, <clears throat> in summary, we now have uh, the, the diagnosis of GLILD in a CVD patient based on the clinical, uh, radiological, and histopathological uh, picture, and we've excluded other ca uh, causes. Um, yeah, we have a young CVD patient without uh, pulmonary symptoms. He doesn't uh, experience any restrictions in, in his daily life with his diagnosis and his uh, pulmonary functional is, uh, function is normal and uh, diffusion capacity nearly normal. So that raises, uh, at least to me, uh, several questions. Are we, did we really uh, do a, uh, enough diagnostics? And, but more importantly, even should we start treatment, yes or no? And if we do so or if we don't, how should follow-up be performed? How, uh, which, with which modality and how long should um, uh, follow-up intervals uh, be? So, um, that thank you. brings me to John. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Anik. And uh, Margarita, if we can have the next polling question here, because uh, I'd like to ask the audience, or as uh, Bor says, the ESID jury, I like that idea. Um, a second question, if I may. Uh, and the question is here, uh, what's the practice where you work? Having made a diagnosis of GLILD, we've just seen that that's not easy in itself. In a patient who's asymptomatic, so no breathlessness, no cough, would you institute specific treatment for GLILD? So that's not about immunoglobulin replacement. We're assuming that the person is on good background immunoglobulin. If someone's asymptomatic and GLILD, would you treat never, always, sometimes, well, I have given you a get out as well because I've put a fourth option there. I don't know. This is too difficult. Um, so, so those are your options. We'll give you just a, uh, a few more seconds uh, to vote. Um, we'll see what you answer. Uh, and then I'll tell you uh, what a panel of experts said when they were asked a, a, a similar question. OK, that's enough time. I think, Margarita, if you've got enough votes, can we put the uh, polls up? So, um it's quite a broad split, isn't it? So uh, about one in five of you never treat, about one in 10 always treat.
uh, perhaps 40% of you uh, sometimes treat and three in 10 just think it's too difficult. And uh, thank you, Margarita. I'm going to the next slide, actually. Um, and, and what that's saying to me is that there are great difficulties, not just in the diagnosis of GLILD, as you've heard uh, described nicely by, by Bohr, but also in relation to when to start treatment. And in the absence of firm evidence of knowing when to start treatments, then at least one thing we can do is compare practice with each other and understand what other people are doing. Uh, and that's what I'm showing you on the slide here. Uh, and this was a survey a few years ago now uh, of UK-based uh, immunologists and pulmonologists asking them when they would start treatment uh, for a person with GLILD. And we considered symptoms, uh, we considered lung function, and we considered the trajectory of lung function over time. And you can see there are only three instances where there was really strong consensus to start treatment in this context. And that was where someone was symptomatic with abnormal and deteriorating lung function. 100% of people actually said, well, yes, I would start treatment in that situation. Notice also that 100% would start treatment if there was abnormal and deteriorating lung function, even if the person was asymptomatic. And the only other case where treatment was broadly agreed was this someone with symptomatic and deteriorating lung function, even if it was still within the normal range. Um, it was clear that people definitely wouldn't treat in someone who had asymptomatic and normal lung function that was stable. And this, I think I would agree with that too. Uh, but notice that that leaves a whole load of different possibilities in the middle where there's much less consensus. Uh, and I hope that reflects with, I hope that uh, chimes with what you've just seen uh, in the poll as well. Next, uh, next slide, please, Margarita. And that really brings me on to the second thing of three that I wanted to, to, to mention to you today. And that's this idea of research priorities. And um, there are so many unanswered questions uh, in relation to GLILD that actually knowing where to start is difficult. Um, Klaus and I co-chair a European Respiratory Society network that's called eGLILDNET. Uh, clinical research collaboration, which I know that many of you take part in. Uh, and we've recently completed and published uh, this research prioritization that gave uh, equal value um, to the opinions of patients and clinicians. Um, so we collected as many research uncertainties and questions as we could. Uh, we uh, summarized those into topics and they went out to voting by patients and clinicians separately. And the overall rank that you can see on the left there uh, is a combination with equal weight to the patient and clinician rank. More details in the publication the references at the bottom of the slide. Uh, but just to note that some of the big questions that come out are in newly diagnosed GLLD is first line treatment superior to watchful waiting. So that would answer the uncertainty that we've just been talking about. Uh, and the other two of the top three questions are uh, how to maintain and how to get remission uh, in someone with GLLD and particularly whether it's uh, corticosteroids or some other uh, approach that might be first line. So, um, these questions need to be answered, uh, and importantly, they are being answered. Uh, evidence is emerging. We'll talk a little bit more about that a bit later on today. Um, but these questions are really critical, and they're questions which are occupying all of us in the GLILD community. And if we go to my next slide, Margarita, my final slide, that really brings, brings me on to the final thing I want to say, and that's how to ask for help. Well, we're all part of uh, different networks. Uh, and networks provide uh, support and multidisciplinary teams who can help you make these difficult management uh, decisions. And there are all sorts of networks available. I work in the UK, for example, uh, and so a colleague in Sheffield, Sarah Goddard, has set up an excellent uh, complex CVID MDT, whereas a group of UK clinicians, uh, multi-professional clinicians, so immunologists, uh, pulmonologists, radiologists, pathologists, we can discuss difficult cases. Uh, Klaus and I also had a European version of that, which is just for the lung manifestations, uh, eGLILDNET. This is a, a, a fledgling MDT, I think it's fair to say. We haven't had the opportunity to discuss many cases yet, uh, but there is a referral route in to, to, to that through Klaus or myself. Uh, and if you don't have alternative local MDTs, then that provides uh, another way of doing that. Um, so that's, uh, that's all from me uh, for now. I look forward to taking part in the discussion and handing back to Anik, I think. Yes, thank you, John. John, that's correct. I have one more uh, slide on our uh, case before we move on to uh, the treatment uh, section. Uh, so uh, we did not uh, start uh, 
therapy uh, right away because we only had one um, uh, one time point. So we started with watchful waiting, and after three months, um, uh, function test and uh, CT scan were uh, repeated, and uh, the disease remained stable. And after that, uh, follow up interval uh, was. Uh, intervals were prolonged until 6, 12, 24, 36 months, and the patient remained stable. However, after more or less four years, um, he started to develop symptoms, so exertional dyspnea and uh, chronic cough, particularly uh, at, at night. Um, and uh, indeed, um, CT scan showed progression of the nodules, and there was a, a further decline in this the diffusion capacity of the patient. So at that time, we decided to uh, start um, medium dose prednisolone, which was successful and led to regression of the nodules, but the diabetes came back, which was now diagnosed as um, uh, latent autoimmune uh, diabetes. Um, and since the prednisone could not be fully tapered, uh, a steroid sparing agent was started. And in this case, uh, we decided on azathioprine since he also had uh, developed uh, colitis in the meantime. But unfortunately, he had another complication on the therapy, namely azathioprine hypersensitivity syndrome. And he was switched again to um, cyclosporin, uh, on which he's st currently still doing uh, very well. So that brings me to the end of the case. And I think I'm allowed to hand over to uh, Joris uh, now. Yes, thank you, Anik. Um, and uh, I will now present on the, on the treatment strategies for GLILG. And I will actually present the data from a systematic review that was published last year in uh, Yaki. Uh, this was an international collaboration and I wanted to acknowledge all contributors for their help uh, with the paper. Next slide, please. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, we used the GLILT definition as was published by uh, Hearst et al. in 2017. Um, GLILT can occur in any type of antibody deficiency, including, including or maybe I should say, especially in patients with a genetic uh, mutation. Uh, and we set out to write this systematic review because we wanted to make a comprehensive overview of the available literature to see if we could get to the stage of an uh, evidence-based medicine-based medicine uh, guideline. Next, please. Um, in the systematic review, we followed the PRISMA guidelines on uh, how to perform a systematic review. Uh, and most of the work was done by Olivia Lamers and uh, Bas Schmitz. Uh, who I want to acknowledge uh, uh, as well. I'm not sure myself. Yeah, I see now the. Um, I, I see the last, the previous slide. So I'm not sure what you are seeing, but I would like to ask for the next slide, please. Yeah. So this is the right slide. Thank you. Uh, so most of the work done was done by two independent researchers, Olivia Lamers and Bas Smits. And uh, in this paper, in the systematic review, we focused on patients with CVID uh, and CVID only, actually, who had a diagnosis of GLILD. And we included only papers that reported both the intervention and the outcome of the, of the treatment intervention. And we excluded the papers that were non peer reviewed, and we excluded all the non English uh, papers. Next slide, please. So this yielded actually a large number of, uh, of papers. More than 5,000 uh, were actually screened in the title uh, and in the, in the abstract. Uh, and after this, we came to a number of 69 patients that were read in full. Uh, and after uh, reading those papers, we ended up with 42 papers uh, that were actually included in the systematic review. Um, and we performed a qualitative and a quantitative analysis in these papers. Next slide, please. So these papers were 29 case reports, three case series and 10 cohort studies. Uh, and what you now immediately see is that there were no controlled trials, uh, let alone any randomized controlled trials. Uh, and what we also noticed is that there were differences in treatment regimens. There were differences in follow-up parameters that were reported, which made it really hard to compare the outcome of the different studies. So if we summarize uh, all studies describing one or more patients 
uh, that was who was treated with corticosteroid monotherapy. Please hit the next button. Uh, then we found 14 studies with a total of 26 patients describing corticosteroid monotherapy. Next, please. Uh, when we look at patients who were treated with, with rituximab monotherapy, there were five studies describing a total of 20 patients. Uh, when we look at rituximab plus azathioprine, uh, this was described in five different studies in a total of 30 patients. And then there were 20 studies describing a mixed bag of treatment re regimens in a total of 179 patients. And I will now give a bit more detail on these studies. Next, please. Um, so in this slide, we look at published information about corticosteroid monotherapy in GLILD in antibody deficiency. And a response as a qualitative outcome was defined as a reported improvement in either the clinical situation, the pulmonary function, or in a CT scan, or in a combination of these parameters. Now, the reported response rate for corticosteroid monotherapy was 27% in all these studies. In seven patients, long-term outcome was reported, and four of these seven actually had a recurrence of GLILG after cessation uh, of the corticosteroid therapy. So obviously, this is an underreporting of the true number of patients that are being treated with corticosteroids, because we think that a lot more patients actually receive corticosteroid induction treatment, and uh, indeed, uh, a higher number of patients is known from the STILPATS study, and those reports uh, or results are still pending, obviously. Uh, the data on corticosteroids may also have had a positive and a negative publication bias, which we could not further assess. Next slide, please. Um, if we look at rituximab monotherapy, there were five studies that mentioned the use of rituximab monotherapy. Remission was induced in 17 of 20 cases, 85%. And four cases were described to have a relapse later on. Next, please. If we look at combination therapy with rituximab and azathioprine, um, then there were five studies that report on its use, describing a total number of 30 patients with exactly this combination of medication without anything else. Uh, the most important paper is the paper is the paper by James Verbsky and co-workers that uh, was published last year. Um, um, uh, and all in all, in the 30 patients who have had this approach without any other immunosuppressants, um, um, they had a quite high response rate, 90%. Uh, and they also had a very high sustained, high and sustained remission rate of 75%. So um, this is actually uh, hopeful. Um, now, next slide, please. Uh, a couple of results on abatacept and stem cell transplantation. Three papers described the use of abatacept, six patients. They all had either LRBA deficiency or CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency. All these patients were reported to be responsive on this treatment. And stem cell transplantation was reported in 25 patients. 16 of those, so this is 64%, uh, were reported to have improved. Four patients were reported to have uh, passed away. And two patients actually were reported to have, uh, to, to have developed GLILD after stem cell transplantation. So stem cell transplantation can cure the disease, uh, but it is uh, obviously uh, a, a procedure that has that carries risks as well as we all know. Next slide, please. Now, in this slide, uh, I'm almost at the end of the presentation. Uh, you see the percentage of patients with improved pulmonary function tests uh, on the left, uh, with improved CAT scans, uh, uh, a bit more to the right, with a clinical improvement or with a 10% improvement in FVC or DLCO. And the bars actually represent the treatment regimens. So steroids are in blue, rituximab is in red, combination therapy is in green, and stem cell transplantation in yellow. So if you focus on the blue bars, you see that corticosteroid monotherapy actually scores 
between 20 and 30 percent response rate for pulmonary function tests, radiological findings that are improved, and an improvement in the clinical situation. Um, if you look at reduction of monotherapy in red, you see uh, that the response rate that was reported is much higher. And if you compare red with green, so reduction of monotherapy with reduction of plus um, azathioprine uh, or a, 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 an alike drug, then you see uh, response rates that are comparable between 70 and, uh, and 85 percent. There are not uh, really a lot differences between re rituximab monotherapy and the combination therapy when you look at the initial responses as are reported in literature. Next slide, please. So um, when, we, when we try to make a conclusion here uh, and when we look at quality uh, using a standardized quality assessment tool, the quality of the studies that are that have been published so far are, is actually low, and that is because they were not uncontrolled studies, uh, and they they did not use uh, predefined outcome measures, or and most of the studies did not use standardized follow-up uh, protocols. So currently, there is actually insufficient data on qualitative and quantitative endpoints. We cannot actually go to the stage of evidence-based medicine. What is best for the treatment of GLILG? But having said this, we can actually, through our whimpers, try to try to see something, and that is that you that the corticosteroid response rate reported in this overview was about 27 percent, and that the reduction of plus azathioprine uh, response rate was approximately 90 percent in described cases. So there seems to be a difference there. Next slide, please. So what the GLILD field is ur what urgently needs actually is, is future studies that, that actually are described in a, in, a, in a standardized way. How was the diagnosis made? Uh, what was the dosage and the interval of the intervention? What were the side effects of treatments? Um, and we, we, we need to collaborate on uh, trying to pick one scoring system to enable comparison between the studies. We need to have a, a, a uniform way of uh, reporting about pulmonary function tests and how to report about lymphocyte phenotyping data. And I really hope that the EGLIL network and other GLILD networks in the US and, and other continents can collaborate so that we can uh, increase the patient number and uh, try to get more, uh, more clinical data. So in the end, we will have to do a controlled study, obviously, but by making uniform uh, outcome measures, we can uh, get to that stage, try to get there. Yeah. So this was the last slide, uh, and I hand back to the next poll question. Can we have the next poll question, please? Yeah. So this is actually referring to the patient that Anik actually presented, and it's a bit uh, it, it, it's a bit uh, like the, the question that John was asking. The patient that Anik was presenting, what would you do? Would you start the patient on prednisone and consider azathioprine or MMF as maintenance therapy? Would you start the patient on rituximab with a concomitant azathioprine or MMF? Would you start another type of treatment or would you, not, would you decide not to initiate treatment? And we will wait a couple of seconds for the results to come in. Yeah. Oh, this is a nice tie here. Uh, so actually now most of the patients actually say, well, uh, we, I would start treatment. And it's about the same between an induction with prednisone and then consider to go for a, a steroid sparing maintenance therapy or to start with rituximab and concomitant as a thioprine or, uh, or MMF. Uh, another type of treatment in 6% and no treatment in 3%. And I think there is a next, there may be a next polling question. Can we have the next slide, please? 
so there's no next polling question. I, I'm giving back to uh, Klaus and Sobjan uh, and uh, for the discussion. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much to everybody for fantastic talks. We've had a lot of complimentary comments in the um, in the chat. So thank you all very much. Can I ask all of the speakers and panel members to put their cameras back on? And don't forget to unmute yourself if you're going to talk. Um, so, Helen, we've given you the um, job of having a look at the question queue, but I'm going to just kick off because I think there are a few kind of co common things coming up and a few questions that people are going to ask. And I'm, I'm going to start with Bora. Um, in terms of diagnoses, uh, because you, you raised two things that I think are um, interesting and important. One is the issue of biopsy. And there's been a question in the chat about um, whether EBUS is better than other methods, but maybe you could comment specifically about what type of biopsies you do. And do you think it matters what the root is and what the size of the piece of tissue is that you get? And then I'll come back to ask you about CT PET. So maybe answer the question about biopsies first. Yes, so I think uh, transbronchial biopsies would not will not give enough uh, tissue to to give an adequate diagnosis. You need surgical biopsies uh, if you if you want a more uh, if you, if you want um, answer to what to what you wonder uh, like fibr fibr fibrosis and, and uh, granulomas. The the transbronchial biopsies, at least according to to our pulmonologists, it's mainly to 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 see. Uh, uh, to, to check for malignancy, um, uh, bronchial malignancy. So, so I think that uh, transbronchial biopsy, uh, at least a traditional transbronchial biopsy, will not be enough. The, 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 um, you have, of course, the, the cryobiopsies that uh, are performed at some centers that uh, where you're able to take a, a bigger piece of, 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 of uh, tissue without, um, and you can do it transbronchially, so which, which would be, a, I guess, a, a great improvement. We have not, we um, we have not done that on on any of over GLID patients, but I, I know that we have um, we have the option. But um, yeah. okay, maybe I'll just ask the other um, the other panel members or experts. And um, what do you do for biopsies? What kind of biopsies do you go, do you favor? Uh, Joris, do you want to go first? Then Klaus, John, um, and any of the others who'd like to pitch in. Um, so speaking for the for the pediatric hospital here in the Netherlands, in this setting, we do we don't do trans uh, bronchial biopsies. So the, the the biopsy should uh, should really be feasible. So it means that the, the the lesion should be at the periphery of the of the lungs, and it should be easily accessible. Uh, and then we can consider to do a biopsy. Yeah, but we don't always do a biopsy in children actually, because the chance that that there is lymphoma involved in children, uh, I think, is a lot lower. The risk is a lot lower. Uh, we do very often do a, a BAL, a BAL. So we exclude infections, but we don't always do a biopsy in children. Okay, thank you. Uh, Klaus? Um, I think we have changed after comparing transbronchial standard biopsy to cryobiopsy, completely to cryobiopsy. We had a hit rate of five in 25 transbronchial biopsies to getting an idea what is going on. Well, it was 24 of 24 in cryobiopsy. So I think we strongly favor cryobiopsy. Um, and we do not perform um, video associated thoracoscopy. Um, we find that too invasive. And, and, and I think that's a big question, which I think I'm still burning to find out where, who is the patient where I really, really need to push it all the way there um, to make sure that I don't miss something and which would really change my um, procedures. So yes, we do perform biopsies as we have gained access now to cryobiopsy and I feel more comfortable doing it that way. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, what's your practice? Yeah, so in, in London, we don't biopsy everybody. If we do biopsy, it's been uh, VATS biopsy. EBUS is a really technique for sampling lymph nodes, of course, and, 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 and we think sampling the parenchyma is the right thing to do if we need to. Uh, we've also not had good success with TBB. Transbronchial biopsy and so have stopped. I think cryobiopsy is interesting. And the other thing to mention is maybe you can biopsy somewhere else if there's disease elsewhere in a different uh, lymph node, for example, or whatever. So, so think laterally. Um, Anna, Helen, or Paul, um, do you want to, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, well, I can add. So if we have a, um, a suspicion of malignancy, what we usually do is an FTG uh, PET scan and then 
um, uh, of course, just like John mentioned, we would uh, pipe C, uh, for instance, a lymph node elsewhere or um, try to localize uh, the portion of the lung. We want to do a VETS biopsy. Um, unfortunately, we don't have cryobiopsy available in uh, our center for the adults yet. Okay. Um, and that kind of segues nicely into my, my question about CT PETs, because I'm always afraid to do CT PETs in patients with CVID because everything lights up. Um, so I find I, 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 we, we don't we don't standardly do baselines. And usually when we need to want to think about wanting to do and I'm thinking, why didn't we do a baseline? So what do what is everybody else doing about pets? I mean, are you using pets for GLILD? Are you using pets? Well, let's stick to let's stick to GLILD or we'll be here all day. So are you using PET scans for GLILD? And maybe, Bora, you could finish up with why, if, if we're not, why uh, you think it would be good for us to add that to our repertoire. And um, so, Joris, uh, are you using PETs? I guess not probably in kids. No, not in kids. We do a low-dose uh, uh, CT, but we mm -hmm. don't do PET in, uh, for GLILD. We do it for other reasons, but not for GLILD. No. Okay. Klaus, how about Same. you? Same for us, um, looking, if I suspect lymphoma, for looking locations where I can do the biopsy, otherwise I don't do it. Yeah. John? We're in danger of agreeing about something here, aren't we? That's a first for the <laughs> <laughs> DLLD. Yes, yeah, so similar. We, we, it's not routine. Which um, doesn't mean that if we agree that we miss out something horrendous. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're, we're going we're to let Bora come back on that and, and, and persuade us um, that, that we, that we ought true. to add it in. Um, so Annick, Helen... Uh, Paul, any of you got a comment on that? No, similarly, we, we also do uh, CT scans. And if there's a lot of lymphadenopathy, you do a PET scan to uh, characterize the lymph nodes more and aim for where to biopsy, okay. like Helen mentioned. Um, so, Bora, I liked your idea about looking for in, inflammatory, potentially using using the PET as a method for trying to work out if somebody's got ongoing active inflammation. How do you actually use the PET in practice? Do you have baselines uh, for all your patients? Do you just do it when they present with GLILD? And how do you follow it up then if you find an abnormality? Oh, I guess we um, we do it like most of it. That we 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 perform a PET when we're uh, when we're fearful. Are, fear, are fearing lymphomas mm -hmm. and we have a patient with a with a uh, deteriorating uh, clinical situation and and of course C cts are the the mainstay of, of glid treatment but then but then when we we, when we started doing pet cts and then we saw of course that they, they have these lymph nodes and then suddenly we, of course we also saw the that there's a fdg uptake in the in the um, in the lung tissue and and treating patients with uh, rituximab they it ma magically disappeared so it was just really uh, it's, and it's i mean it's it's a fun uh, um, uh, it's 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 fun to watch that and and, and i think it's also is it it, it it is of some value and um, um uh, and especially um, we have had patients with a with a near terminal uh, lung disease where we're wondering okay how much inflammation is, is is this something that we can modulate with with treatment or or is, is it, uh, uh, do we want to to expose patients to rituximab again and then i think uh, uh, the pet ct could be a, a valuable tool in uh, in assessing that yes okay thanks and do you use it to look for remission uh, as uh, as a regular Test. Well, we did, we have done it for a, a few patients. Uh, okay. um, um, initially, when we started using rituximab, we we thought it would be a, a, a way to 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 evaluate the treatment. But but now we're, we're I mean we're fairly confident of the effect of rituximab, and we feel confident evaluating our patients with all the measures. So then then we don't use PET okay. for that. All right. Um, thanks for that. Helen, I'm just going to ask you, because I was going to move on to treatment, um, unless there are specific questions in the Q&A or chat about diagnosis. There are, uh, so, few, there are a few more, right, Helen? Okay. So go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, I think, the, I think one is, I think one I find intriguing, um, it came from Fabian Hauck asking, is there other pathogens involved in, in, in the granuloma? And so he asked specifically about rubella um, driving it. And I think that we all remember the Jake's Met publication, or not all, but the one who are gray haired, remember the um, Jake's Met publication on AJ38 um, potentially driving um, ILD and, and CVID. And so I think there has been, again, the fascination um, whether pathogens are driving it. So um, 
my question would be um, maybe to Paul in this case. Um, do you screen or do you search for pathogens um, on research base or in clinic beyond what um, Burry has recommended very nicely? Um, right now, we're not doing anything beyond that. I think we certainly, um, I, to be honest with you, I think we often hope to see if there is an infectious cause that we can try to treat rather than move forward. And so we, we really rigorously try to see, is this bronchiectasis is driving the symptoms? Is this something infectious? We'll do a lot of sputums. And, but these are most, mostly conventional, um, you know, clinical evaluations. We're not doing something in terms of really advanced or on a research basis, but I think that's clearly, um, you know, really important. I mean, this is occurring uh, at a mucosal surface where there's just exposure to so much. And, you know, a lot of these patients don't have IgA. So there's obviously, you know, this disruption of their mucosal barrier in ways that probably relate to why they're getting GI disease as well. Right. So um, I think that's very, very interesting, uh, but, uh, I don't have anything <laughs> really Thanks. exciting to answer your question with. Unfortunately. I think would, the next person I would also like to uh, ask is Helen. Helen, I mean, you published on it. So come on, what are you searching for? And what do you think your data show? Yeah, so we, we studied um, actually pharyngeal microbiome composition in relate, relation to lung disease. And we saw actually, um, so the hypothesis is that the composition, since there's micro aspiration always occurring from um, your throat to the lower airways, that um, some people believe that the, the, the oral pharyngeal uh, uh, microbiome might represent in, in a way what's going on in the lungs. And what we saw was the strongest association between some bacteria and airway disease, not so much of uh, GLILD. And I think our study was too small to draw st strong conclusions conclusions uh, with respect to GLRLD. So for other people who, people who think that there might be a causal relation, it's interesting uh, would be to increase the, the cohort. And some of the bacteria we found was uh, Prefutella species, uh, which have been uh, known to be associated with other inflammatory con conditions. So of course, we cannot prove anything with this, but I think it's food for thought. And uh, it would be very interesting to do microbiome uh, analysis on BAL fluids, because probably that best reflects what's going on in the lungs and see whether that um, uh, can give some more ideas about the role of bacteria probably present in lower abundance um, in the airways um, and um, a relation to disease. Yeah, thank you. And I think that could connect back to the last slide of Paul, right, where you were showing interferon gamma that one driving buff. And um, whatever is driving interferon gamma um, could be pathogens, obviously, and um, being exposed to um, APCs and other cells specialized in this. That's true. And, yeah, and, and uh, some, some other people believe that there is a gut lung axis. Um, uh, some work is done. Uh, uh, by Debbie Bogart, for instance, on that subject. And that's also something that might be interesting to, uh, uh, to, 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 to dig into. So the idea that bacteria in the gut that have been published to be different than people with inflammatory complications might travel to the body and uh, cause inflammation elsewhere. So for instance, in the lungs. Mm. Yeah, very nice. I think just one mm. before we go to treatment, because I think um, there, I think there's one more for a pediatrician a question, and I think one brief mentioning which totally mind boggles me. As as Barry mentioned, often the CT scan is shown, and the radiologist says highly suspicious for aspergillus. I don't know how many of you have heard that. That happened in our center plenty times, and every time they say that in our patients, I know okay, this patient has ILD. Um, the funny thing is, um, one time, when, when usually we perform bowel, and one time we found sufficient aspergillus in the bowel, so we were suddenly um, posed the question, um, should we treat aspergillus, <laughs> even though we were quite sure that this is ILD. So Bodo, who was taking care of that patient, insisted that, yeah, we should treat aspergillus. So we treated aspergillus, and the lesions disappeared. Um, this is the only patient where I have seen that. I've never, um, to be honest, I've never really done it that clearly either. Um, we have not found aspergillus in bowel very often, um, but I still think there are definitely pathogens which may drive um, inflammatory changes um, in our patients. And I think it's definitely worth following up on that. And the one question I saw additionally, I think that's a question especially for you, Joris, is CT, do we need CT in children? 
Um, and there was, um, if we have pulmonary function and, and do we need to CT scan and how do you follow up with that? I think there was one question related to that. And I think it was especially referring to the pediatric cases. Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. But in children, you see the same as in adults, that the, the CT scan is, has a far larger sensitivity to pick up GLILD than the pulmonary function tests or then the clinical situation of the patient or the immune phenotype. So there's no way that you that you can predict what will happen on the CT scan by by one of these other parameters alone. So the, the we do use uh, the pulmonary function test in follow-up, but we cannot say that the patient is in remission by using pulmonary function test. So every once in a while they get a CT scan. If they are stable, that is once every two years. But if they are unstable, it may be once a year, and sometimes it may be a, a bit sooner even. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I hand back to Siobhan. Okay, for, thanks. For the big session on treatment now. <laughs> I know, yeah, and we're, and, we're, and we're getting low on time. Um, so big question, I get, but the first question to ask is, um, when do you start treatment? Um, uh, so at what point would you start therapy? And maybe if we just ask, so we've had some data presented about this, but there was a question in the chat about when to start. And um, maybe we could just go around and get some personal communication about what you actually do in practice. Um, Stefan, so maybe also uh, mention the situation now, the current situation with COVID and rituximab. Maybe that's also interesting to cover. Okay, yep. So if as your first initial therapy, um, Joris, what are you using for early, your first early treatment? Uh -huh. So to be honest, up till now, we have used steroids for induction treatment. Um, but, but I think that, that pretty soon afterwards, we will, we will have the discussion here. Shouldn't we use rituximab uh, plus one other agent as, uh, even as induction uh, treatment? Uh, so it's a tie uh, in, this, in this hospital for children, what, what we will choose. Yeah. Okay. And we, have had, we, have, we have seen uh, good results with both the regimens as induction. Yeah. And how do you decide when to start? Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, when, I, uh, when I consult our pulmonologist, they say, well, we strive for a scan almost without abnormalities. So any patient with abnormalities on the scan that is compatible with, with uh, GLILD, in a specific amount, it need not be nothing or almost nothing. But if it's a, if it's a quite uh, in, a, um, abnormal amount of lesions, then they will advise treatment. Yeah. So okay. even if the pulmonary function test is normal and the patient has no complaints. Okay. Yeah. And Klaus, how about you? When do you start? What do you use first? Yeah. So when to start? I think um, as it was shown very nicely, symptoms are important. Um, I do perform um, exercise tests. Um, I think even patients who are not symptomatic or say that they're not symptomatic have normal lung function. I do force them or ask them to do <laughs> exercise testing because um, I find that, as it was also shown by Burra, I think it shows us maybe some additional patients who may profit from, from treatment. So I think if they're pathologic in any of these, um, I would consider it, do I treat chest CT scan? Um, not in general, but in connection with age. So I think with children having these changes already, I would worry more than when I see these changes probably in a 60-year-old. Um, so I think that would probably I understand your concerns. Yeah, and, and what do I use? Um, we have traditionally used steroids um, in these patients and followed up on them very um, closely and decided whether we need additional treatment um, if we see that we can't taper steroids or um, um, see that actually worsening or recurrent disease. And then okay. we would not go back with steroids, but we would go immediately um, to second line treatment. And the preferred treatment currently here is as well, rituximab with the caveat that in this time, it, it is, needs to be considered and the patient needs to be informed about it. Yeah. Yeah. And have you still been using rituximab in COVID if you still think that that's the best treatment for the patient and the patient agrees? We, we have. We have. And fortunately, we have not had a patient who then afterwards came back and said, now I have COVID. So what I'm going to do now? Yeah. But I mean, it's ongoing. So we're still not out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And John, how about you? What's your, when do you start? What do you use? <laughs> 
I think we've certainly been we've been tolerant of seeing changes coming and going on the adult CT scans uh, in patients that we have. That would not for us be a, a, a reason to treat. But in the context of deteriorating an abnormal lung function, I think that's what really gets it for me. Um, uh, and doing that early. So before we're seeing permanent structural damage. Uh, and, and what with? Well, we have some challenges in accessing uh, rituximab in the UK, which I guess is increasingly probably my my first choice but that's difficult so we're still using steroids and i don't think we should be ashamed of that they work they work really well for for a while and then you're left with a question of what to maintain people on and, and, and our second line drug of choice here is mycophenolate so i was a bit surprised before i give everybody else a chance to say what they say that um in fact your information about steroids didn't look that great so the overall conclusion is we only got remission in 30 percent, less than 30 percent of patients that that doesn't feel right for me in terms of our clinical um in terms of our clinical experience i'm going to ask klaus who i know has got a bit of data about this in steel pad what do, what do you think klaus do you think it's that low for are steroids that bad right no thank you very much Joan. and I, I agree with you and i think most of us have have made that experience i think um starting patients with this disease on steroids seem to work and usually we start with half a milligram per kilogram and i'm talking about adults now i'm not capable of talking about children but and adults um usually um rarely with one milligram um per kilogram um we would start um we usually do see response and the problem, and so the initiation of that works. And the question is, how long does it work? And I do, and I think the case reports um, basically don't cover that. Therefore, I totally agree with yours. I think the systematic review can't tell us anything about steroid treatment because most of us use it and don't report it. And if something terrible happens, um, um, yeah, we might report it, but probably not for steroids. And all the other studies reporting steroid-treated patients reported them because they failed steroids and used another treatment. And therefore, I think it is. I think it's impossible. So in the Stillpad study, and it's still analyzed, but I, we're hoping to come out within the next um, months and to at least submit it. Um, and it looks like um, that steroid does have this beneficial effect in the beginning in many patients. And this effect may be sufficient for a um, um, relevant number of patients, even for longer term, um, not requiring additional treatment for the follow-up for two, three plus poss potentially years. So I think, yes, there's still an, a possibility to use steroids in mild cases. I would not consider it as a first line or um, just therapy for patients with more severe disease. And I would definitely not use it in patients who have had their steroid chance and did not respond and had relapses on that. I think that is the case where I would definitely go in with a second line therapy. Um, I would find that very important. But yes, I do feel in this um, probably heterogeneous population of GLIB patients, there is still a place for first line um, use steroids and that may be sufficient for um, these milder cases. Okay, thanks. Um, so, um, Anna, Helen, Paul, and Bora, do any of you have different practice? Do you, uh, do you want to just say briefly what you do for when you start and what you treat with? Um, I guess I could add a, a point to this. I, I, and I think I agree uh, what, what, what has said. I think maybe one piece to this, which might be, um, I, I think, a characteristic of the way medicine is practiced here in the States, but often the patients that come to our centers have been sort of managed incompletely elsewhere and are, are in a little bit of trouble by the time someone starts to seek us out. And I think in those circumstances, we often, uh, that might shape how we treat and we become a little bit more inclined to go with the rituximab uh, rather than wait and see with, with corticosteroids. So I think that shapes a little bit about, it's part of what we do. Um, and, you know, prior to COVID, I think a lot of the logic with rituximab, especially monotherapy was, well, they're on immunoglobulin replacement anyway, their B cells aren't doing much good. Often these patients have autoimmunity and hyperplasia. They're, you're going to get a couple of benefits out of the rituximab. Maybe the platelet count will go up, maybe the spleen will shrink and the lung disease gets better. And you're not really adding a, you know, a significant amount more of immunocompromise you know, suppression because, well, they're on antibody replacement. So I think that was a lot of the thought, you know, uh, pre-COVID, obviously that's changing a little bit, although I can't say it's really changed my practice personally, because I feel like, you know, there's not much that we can do. We're, we're about to get, we're trying to get the prophylactic monoclonals going and things like this, but 
Um, and some of it, the antibodies are now getting in the replacement uh, therapy. So that might make us feel a little bit better. But um, yeah, I would say that for me, I think generally speaking, we end up with rituximab pretty early. Okay. Um, do any, would any of the others like to pitch in with anything different? Nope. Okay. So then I'm going to ask you all, um, I'm going to do a hands up. So hands up if you always start second line treatment. Nobody. Oh, John, John's going to say yes. Yeah. So we would, I, I think our approach would be to try and induce remission with higher dose steroids, wean down the steroids, and at that point, introduce second line, which for us is mycophenolate. That would be the general approach. Okay. So how many people on the, on, of the expert panel would use steroids, taper off the steroids, and then wait and see what happens? Any of you? We have done that and have seen remission lasting in these patients. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Helen, you've been shaking your head. So I'm going to ask you, what's your opinion about this area? Yeah. So usually we, we try, if we start with remission, remission induction with steroids, short course steroids mm -hmm. and never longer highly dosed. Um, and therefore I think uh, we would, uh, mostly try um, if we don't choose for rituximab for another antiromatic drug, so not necessarily is isothiopine, but mycophenolate, which is one of the questions uh, in the poll, um, uh, in the Q&A as well. Um, I think it's also really high up our uh, priority list. Um, and I think it also depends on the severity of uh, uh, the DLILD. So if it's a really extensive disease, um, I think we would not just stick to um, the corticosteroid monotherapy. Okay. Um, Bora, do you have anything to add on this topic? I just think um, Paul added an important issue that uh, when you're treating with rituximab, you also get some additional uh, uh, positive uh, effects. And, and I think um, what we hear from our patients is that they, they say, oh, yes, my lungs are, are better, but I also feel better. I mean, I'm, 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 they have less, uh, have less feeling of, of being... Um, in, inflammatory in, in some way so it, it i mean it, it and uh, as we see on on the pet cities i mean the the whole load of inflammation in lowers uh, on the treatment with with rituximab and we luckily we haven't had any uh, we had one patient with a with a cmv reactivation that we um, ascribed to 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 rituximab but other than that we haven't had really any any serious side effects okay um Yvonne, can I just mention, I think because just picking up on that, I think one trial we did with Abatacept, which didn't go into the systemic review because it was late, so to speak, or it was mentioned actually, but it was not part of that. Um, I would not recommend Abatacept for severe lung disease. I feel at least in the dose we're using it, it was not strong enough to really change dramatically. Um, however, I think what just Barry mentioned that is something we definitely saw in the Abata set that patients, and there were a lot of parameters moving the right direction. They just weren't quickly there and they weren't not just changing black and white picture um, of lung disease. So I think Abata set is for mild lung disease, potentially also an option, but I don't think it's the one for severe lung disease. And if, if, if I may, we have some difficulties there around what we mean by the severity of lung disease. And actually, if you're talking about um, structural severity that that may be too late to affect and in, in a way what you need is is the things that uh, Paul and others have been talking about which you could construe as markers of disease activity rather than disease severity gosh we've got so much to learn I think in in, in how mm. to use medicines um, very true so I'm also going to ask for because I'm conscious of the passage of time as always on these uh, these grand rounds and um, I'm going to ask everybody what they what they what they use for maintenance therapy so let's assume you've had induction successful induction with steroids and you've decided in this patient that you want to go for maintenance therapy what's your what's what's your preference yours do you want to start um actually we choose MMF more often than uh, azathioprine uh, because the long-term risk of the azathioprine um, and what you get with the MMF is that it usually also works for the cytopenias. But what you see when you look at the GLILD is actually a couple of months, maybe usually six months after the rituximab was given, you see B-cell reconstitution, you see the GLILD actually coming back. You give another dose of rituximab and it sort of washes away again. So, and there was one question in the chat as well what do you do on the long term with the rituximab so we have now one patient that is now in her third year of rituximab maintenance therapy 
Uh, we don't know what the long-term effects actually will be, obviously, yeah. but we feel that this is such a good therapy for her that we that we decided to continue it. Uh, so we do give long-term reduction up, and I think that is the, the, the in those patients the mainstay, the main pillar of the of the remission uh, of the GLILD. Yeah, that's what okay. I think. So yeah. MMF or Retux, Klaus. Retux. We have okay. used MMF as well, but we have more frequently used recurrent rituximab treatment. Okay, uh, John. Uh, most commonly, mycophenolate, sometimes with very low dose residual steroid. Yeah, um, Anik. Yeah, we also tend more to MMF. Uh, previously, also azathioprine, but yeah, mostly MMF. And I think you should also uh, look at other disease manifestations. If if there are other, like in the example, azathioprine was more beneficial for the colitis. We also have one patient with CLL. Then perhaps rituximab would be uh, more useful to to cover both. So also look at uh, the rest of the patient. Okay, Helen. Yeah, we've used different medications, but I think what's probably worth to to share is that with some patients that are really long-term uh, rituximab, we've tried to taper the dose, so reduce to, for instance, um, 500 milligrams once every six months. And for some patients that work and they stay in remission, and we try to suppress them with as little medi yeah, medicine as possible. Okay, Paul? Yeah, I would say I agree with what's been said. I think when we have patients that have, uh, we have particular concern about their T cell uh, being involved in their CVID that we may choose rituximab or current rituximab as the maintenance. But I think overall, mycophenolate probably is a little, used a little more frequently. But I would say th those are the two for sure. Okay, Bora? Um, rituximab, and, and I guess we follow the practice like uh, Helen uh, um, stated that we, we try to reduce the dose uh, and it seems to be working. And so is, is, are any of you, hands up if anybody is using rituximab plus azathioprine together? Helen is. As maintenance, you mean? Yeah, as maintenance. No. No. So rituximab and azathioprine is maintenance therapy. In one patient who was not sufficiently controlled by rituximab alone. Okay, so Helen, you suggest that you've used it, but only at induction. Yeah, and maybe a repeated induction if I stopped and I needed both again. Okay, so you use both short term, stop, use both again. Okay, Paul, what about you? You look like you nodded as well. Yeah, I think I, what, I guess I what I how I would say is that we would use both initially, and then we would we would just stick with one. As okay. Me. So I think, do, you, yeah. do you have a preference for which one you stick with? Um, I think it depends on the patient. Uh, mycophenolate tends to be easier, just logistically getting approval. We sometimes run into approval, insurance approval for the rituximab, uh, so it's easier just to prescribe the mycophenolate. To be quite honest, sometimes. Okay. Uh, but that, do you, do you use do you say so do you use rituximab and mycophenolate together, or rituximab and azathioprine, or both? For the maintenance, I could. Um, I think it's usually going to be one of them. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, does anybody stop treatment if T cell numbers fall in their patients? Okay, I've got two people nodding, Helen and Paul. When do you stop? Or, or what do you stop and when? Get CMV reactivations and stuff like that. So if they run into problems, uh, yeah, we, we try that or we try to switch into a different therapy. And some of them, especially patients with CTLA, haploid insufficiency, really get in trouble. Okay, um, Paul. And have you seen that more frequently with uh, MMF than rituximab? Because I think that is combination what, uh, therapy and combination therapy. So I have right. one patient with EBV, um, also right. with CVID and EBV, and she's doing well with the rituximab, and I'm never going to stop that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, similar. And I think we have seen MMF, EBV reactivation under MMF also in our patients. So I think it really depends on the patient. I think that's mm. probably a good statement <laughs> always. Yeah. Uh, Paul, did you have anything else you wanted to add on that? Are we done? No, no, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, right. What else did I want to ask? Was there, Helen, I'm conscious of time, so we're not going to have time to do too much more, but I did want to ask Paul something about the histology and treatment. So we're all taking biopsies. I think, I think biopsies are a good idea in general, but is all GLILD the same Thank on, you. histologically? And does it actually make a difference to treatment? Or now we want to is, hear. Is, is that a future aspiration? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I could take the cop out and say that's a future aspiration because I don't. I don't think we have data for me to be confident and to tell you that it truly does. I feel 
that that is what ultimately the direction we're going. I feel like the GLILD is a broad term and there's probably not all exactly the same uh, underneath that. Uh, and that some folks, I mean, we see it. Some folks are respond to rituximab really profoundly and other ones you clearly need the combination. You clearly need a T-cell agent there. Um, so I think that there's probably some differences. And you, um, you, yeah. Sorry, do you see that in your histology? So can you make quite a quite a big push for B cells? <laughs> we think um, we do, but I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I it seems to to us in our experience, and this is anecdotal, and there is not we don't have a controlled trial to really line up rituximab monotherapy versus combination and yep. compare them and really say. So I could say anecdotally, and our feeling is that when they when we see a lot, when we see those patients that we see the the IgM increase, we see a lot of you no know, follicular hyperplasia, a lot of B cells, we tended to think that, okay, we're gonna give rituximab here. Maybe we can spare the, the T cell agent in these patients. And, and they often respond very well. Now, maybe they would have responded just as well if we weren't so focused on that. And we were just saying, let's do rituximab first for everybody because we wanna to try to spare them the agents. I don't know, because we didn't really compare them. So I think some of it could be you know, our own bias to be quite honest. But, I, but my feeling is yes, I think the more we study this, I think we may see that there is some difference and maybe the biopsies will become more useful or more clearly useful as is right now I agree with the consensus that they maybe don't tell us as much as we hope they would necessarily. Okay, a very quick question for the panel because I think this is an interesting one that came in the box. Do you still give rituximab or choose rituximab as first line to patients who have no or very low numbers of B cells? So do you use the peripheral immune phenotyping to alter what you give for GLILD treatment? Everybody shaking their head. Does anybody want to say that they do use peripheral blood immune phenotyping to alter their treatment? No. Chuck Klaus is thinking. So oh, I have I a CTLA-4 patient who has zero B cells in her blood who had rituximab um, more than a decade ago for ITP or something else. Yeah. And we were fortunate enough to have an uh, VET biopsy and there are absolutely no B cells in her lungs. So I think there is probably no point. And even though we never know whether the peripheral blood really reflects what's going on in the blood, uh, in the tissue, but for this person, there definitely is a concordance. Right. And I think uh, that was what I was thinking along. So I think if you have used rituximab and there are absolutely no B-cell recurrence, um, it doesn't mean that you still eliminated all of them, but I think at some point it probably will reflect it to some extent. So I think, as Helen said, I think we cannot exclude that there are still B cells in the in, in the organ, and we have seen rituximab responses in patients with very low B cell numbers. So I think that is definitely no reason not to give rituximab if that's a reason, if it's a disease where you think rituximab should help. Um, however, I think... Um, I mean, if there are zero, zero, zero B cells, and um, I will tell you something at some point, especially after you're treating rituximab for a while, and and so I think it is it's a consideration, but I would not steer my um, um, treatment decision by it. I would say. Yeah. Okay, and are any of you hands up if any of you are using sirolimus? antifibrotic age? Oh, some people are using sirolimus. Okay, in some patients, I'm presuming that. Okay, uh, antifibrotic agents? No, and somebody else had a question about... Belimumab. Okay, belimumab. Now, Paul, this must be really striking your heart when you read that. <laughs> I have not done. So has anyone done belimumab treatment in any of these patients? So, Klaus, you might want to tell us all what belimumab is. Uh, I think Paul deserves the honor to explain it because it was mental. his idea and he was pushing it. Uh, well, yeah, I was pushing it, and then I then I went to Boston, and we're not doing it. So um, we were going to set up a clinical trial when I was at Mount Sinai to do this um, because we had the patient numbers, and the idea I think would be for maintenance therapy. So so this is an anti BAP treatment, and so this is so BAP is a cytokine B cell activating factor that you know promotes B cell survival, promotes B cell activity, and so our thinking would be that and this is what they do in lupus already is you give an induction where you deplete the B cell. Uh, as well as, you know, you can in, maybe in, deplete other cells and then you give an anti bath because now you can give it actually a subcutaneous injection and, and it could be a little bit more practical to do and it becomes a maintenance to keep the B cells from recurring. You know, I think effectively something like mycophenolate ha can have a similar role in terms of reducing the B cell recovery. And so maybe there, you know, we're kind of can predict what it might do. Um, but I can't say we, we, we have that data and I, I do love the question. I, I appreciate it. I think it could be an option.
but you have not even treated a single patient with it. No. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We're going to wind up this, <laughs> although I have to say. I mean, it's, it's is... tough to get these therapies. We can't just, I don't know if it's, you know, in the States, you have to like, you know, give the insurance company, a, you know, a, a novel in order to get approval. So it's not easy to do. Yeah. Um, I'm going to wind up because oh, so, sadly, because actually I'm really still enjoying this, but we are uh, 15 minutes over the absolute limit that we put on this uh, on th this uh, grand round. And um, I, I think it's a it's a testament to the quality of the talks and the panels, uh, the panelists that we still got 108 people on the uh, <laughs> on the participation list. At this at this time of the evening, and um, so I think it's been yeah really good. It's been a really great um, session. I'm going to give John a last word in a minute, but um, I would it would be great if we could um, get a download, Margarita, of the questions from both from the chat and the Q and A because I confused everybody by telling them to put them in the wrong place earlier on. And then as a panel, we'll try and go through the other questions that didn't get answered and upload some kind of document with a Q&A answers to the uh, Clinical Working Party webpage. But I guess give us a week or two to do that. Um, John, I'm gonna give you final, um, final word on this because clearly there are a lot of things going forward that we need to do for um, to, to understand GLILD and the work that yourself and Klaus are doing with the eGLILD and that's gonna be really important. And um, can I just ask you about people looking for um, uh, help about managing patients in the interim. You had mentioned an MDT. Do you want to just maybe reiterate um, how people can reach out if they're looking for help? Uh, yeah, you can do that through Klaus or for myself. And we have a referral form. Uh, so my email address, j.hurst.ucl.ac.uk. Uh, please feel free to be in contact. Siobhan, you're right uh, and, uh, about the need for more work and, and my uh, approach to that. And our approach to that has to be that we have to work together, right, to, to, to do this. And so uh, if you've given me the last word, then I'm going to take it. And I'm going to take it by saying thank you for everyone for attending. Uh, and thank you, Siobhan, to you and to the ECID team, actually, for facilitating this. Because, you know, suddenly GLILD is on the agenda. We haven't been there before. And, and, and that's so important. So it's, it, it's thanks to you all. Great. Thanks, everybody. That was a really great session. I enjoyed it a lot.